I'd like to introduce our first panelist tonight, and we're going to bring each panelist up uh, one at a time. And our first panelist from April 2009 through June of 2014 served as the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you very much. And before that, she served as Governor of Kansas from 2003 to 2009. She's currently the CEO of Sibelius Resources, LLC where she provides strategic advice to private companies, nonprofit organizations, higher education institutions, and financial investors. Please join me in welcoming Secretary Kathleen Sebelius. Now we're going to have to take a moment where they mic each one of us up, so I will try to fill the time by saying something that uh, sounds like I know what I'm talking about. Uh, so, first of all, this is your first visit to campus, is that right? It is. Well, okay, well, we're very happy to have you here. Uh, so let me start off with the conversation. You were secretary during the uh, creation of and the passage of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and part of that, of course, was the issue of Medicaid expansion. It, it, it was part of the, the basic structure. How significant was it in, in the original thought process in, in creating this, and how significant was the Supreme Court decision, which has sort of made it uh, different in different parts of the country? Then? Well, I think the, um, the expansion of Medicaid was a sort of fundamental part of looking at a continuum of care, and I thought it might be helpful. First of all, I want to stop for one moment and thank the Chancellor and you, Ambassador Katz, for just putting together the American Public Square. I think it's an incredibly important opportunity to have conversations about challenges and issues facing um, American people and do it with civil discourse, which is um, rarefied air in Washington uh, too often, so great to be here. Um, what I thought I might do is take just a moment to actually just talk about the history of Medicaid be, to sure. lay a foundation because I think it's important to understand where that program was well before 2010 when the Affordable Care Act was signed. Um, Medicaid was actually a, at an afterthought when Medicare was passed in 1965. Um, so 50 years ago the program came into existence and it was the additional benefit for those Americans who qualified for cash assistance welfare. There wasn't any separate application, there wasn't a separate program. If you qualified for cash assistance, you then had health benefits added. And it was, and I think the legislation even talks about the deserving poor, um, a limited number of parents, uh, families, uh, disabled and elderly were part of that program. Uh, about 20 years later in the 80s, uh, the program began to be disassociated from the welfare program. It became more of a health program and the categories were broadened who would qualify, but always lower income working individuals or those who, who were not working who qualified for health care. Um, then it stepped up in 1996 uh, when welfare reform was passed there was no more cash assistance. Families who were um, qualified to get some sort of assistance were then uh, required to look for work and have a time limit on their welfare benefits. But the health program, starting in 1996, was seen as different. It was actually a broadened and expanded way to have health benefits, not really connected to welfare any longer, but broader categories of folks. CHIP was passed in 1997 um, for children and has been expanded since. Uh, and then the expansions continued. So fast forward to 2010. The Affordable Care Act really then looked at where the gaps were in health coverage in America. There were certainly gaps for people who were in a work situation without affordable care trying to pay 100% of the costs on their own. Their employer wasn't contributing, so that was one of the places that there was a gap. And then because states could set their own eligibility for lots of categories that weren't mandated, there were lots of gaps with the lowest income workers. 
and Congress decided to actually expand the Medicaid program for, again, the lowest income. 138% um, of poverty is people making $27,000 a year for a family of three or less. Um, so it was seen as making that a consistent standard across the country rather than a state-by-state -state standard. And then beyond that, individuals who didn't have affordable coverage in their workplaces would have an ability to draw down a tax credit and help them purchase coverage the way their employer would help with insurance coverage. And most of this now is in the private marketplaces. Most states, including um, Kansas, run the Medicaid. Pri this is not government-run insurance. It's really private healthcare companies who were providing the benefits to individuals. Um, it was seen as, a again, a way to reduce the 40 million uninsured folks we had in this country, but also to begin to shift toward preventive care and health care as opposed to acute care. Um, so that's the way the law was written. It was anticipated that all states would uh, take advantage of what is, I think, the single most generous federal state revenue sharing program. 100% of the costs of the uninsured for the first three years and then gradually reducing the federal share, but never less than 90% over a 10-year period of time. Um, and what we have now post-Supreme Court is a real patchwork where 29 states, Republican and Democratic governors, have chosen expansion. And uh, I think there are three more in the pipeline uh, with Utah and South Dakota and others looking at expansion. Um, and then the rest of the states still debating whether or not they will ensure those individuals. In Kansas, um, right now, if you are a parent in a family of three and make less than $5,600 a year, $5,600 a year, you qualify for some health care. If you do not have children or if you're a parent making more than that, you qualify for no assistance. And I would say in Kansas, again, a lot of the people who are uninsured are students and veterans and very low income workers, um, but there's a real gap. Okay, but, but and, and if I'm not mistaken, <coughs> the way the Affordable Care Act was written, the subsidy that was available to people in terms of who, who would get private insurance <coughs> but couldn't afford private insurance right. uh, was, made, was going to be made available uh, only to those people uh, in other words, those people who are in a state where they don't do the Medicaid expansion and the amount is a less than 100% of the federal poverty level as for Medicaid uh, eligibility, those people are kind of like... They're out in the cold. They, they, have, no, they have no subsidy at all. So is the that, Act that, was written as a continuum of care. For the lowest income, Medicaid would be available. As you made additional money, then you would qualify for... Um, the marketplaces with a federal subsidy attached to it. So we have right now all these people who don't qualify for They're anything. They're too poor to get expect, help with health care. Right, which have, at least, at least as, the, as the act currently is constructed. That's correct. Well, well let's, let's expand the conversation a little. Uh, we have with us tonight the Cato Institute's Director of Health Policy Studies. He's the co-editor of Replacing Obamacare and co-author of Healthy Competition. He holds a bachelor's degree in American government from the University of Virginia and an MA in economics and a, uh, law degree in, a degree in law and economics from George Mason University. Please ha join me in welcoming, welcoming Michael Cannon. So, he doesn't well, need a microphone. Okay, <laughs> so, 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 so while, while they're plugging your microphone in, uh, let, me, let me just sort of ask a question, which would be, you know, you talk, you're, you're the co-editor, as, as your bio says, of replacing Obamacare. Uh, let's focus for a minute, if we can, on Medicaid. And the concept of Medicaid expansion that was an, an integral part of this, do you feel with the Supreme Court decision that uh, it's made things worse? Or better? 
Well, that's a complicated question. It's, I think it's, first, first let me say thank you, Alan, and thank you to the Chancellor for putting this event on, and Kathleen and Taryn and Daniel and all of you for, for coming and participating in this and for inviting me to participate. Uh, it's, a, it's a complicated question uh, because I, 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 I want to say that what the Supreme Court did there, as it has done in, in, elsewhere, was actually to rewrite the law in a way that Congress never intended. And so while I am glad that states have more control over the implementation of this law and that they're not being coerced, I am also troubled by the fact that the Supreme Court essentially took a, changed the law into a law that could not have passed Congress. So, but you know, the, the, the reason I'm, uh, I'm glad that states have uh, more control over this law is, uh, and, and, are, and are able to block it, and it might take a, a little bit of explanation, but uh, uh, something that uh, it, you may not know about, about Taryn and me is that uh, Taryn, who will be up on the stage soon, is that we're, is that we're friends. We have a lot of things in common. Uh, he's got, we, we've both got a mess of young children. He's got four kids. I've got three. Uh, age is his oldest is nine. My youngest is two and a half. And uh, so you may be wondering, how can we both be here right now? And the answer is something else we have in common, which is we both married amazing women. Um, and we're also parents of twins, uh, another thing we have in common. But you, you'll see in your program that uh, I was called by the New Republic, Obamacare's single most relentless antagonist. And they didn't mean that as a compliment. Uh, <laughs> I, I took it as a compliment, uh, uh, and, and I'll explain why in a moment. And Taryn has, uh, you know, is the CEO of an organization that, that argues that states should not expand the Medicaid program. So why would, why would two people do this, this, this sort of thing? Uh, argue against a law that is at least supposed to make health care more accessible for low-income people. The answer gets back to those seven kids. Uh, I want my children to be able to have health insurance that is secure, that provides them secure access to coverage, that doesn't disappear when they get sick, that doesn't uh, create incentives for insurers to do whatever they can to avoid them. I want them to have health insurance that where if they get sick and their insurance company starts shirking on uh, their commitment, starts breaking their promises to my children, I want them to be able to fire their health insurance company. and have other health insurance companies compete to cover them, to compete to cover them even if they're sick. And I want low-income children to have this, that same opportunity, and, I want, and, and that is not possible as long as this law remains on the books, because this law is not going to provide, and is not providing secure health coverage, either through the exchanges or through the Medicaid expansion. As an example of that, the first thing that would happen if either Kansas or Missouri expanded Medicaid is what? Is what? A whole lot of people between 100% and 138% of the federal poverty level will lose their health plans. They're enrolled in the exchanges now. If Kansas expand, or Missouri expands, they're thrown out of their exchange plans, like so many Americans were by this law, and then they're put into Medicaid. And then what kind of coverage do they have in Medicaid? Uh, let, me, let me take a poll of the audience here. Can you raise your hand if you've ever heard of the name Diamante Driver? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven maybe eight hands. Diamante Driver uh, was a 12-year-old boy who lived not far from where I live uh, in Virginia. He was in Prince George's County, Maryland. And though he was eligible for Medicaid, in other words, he, was he had a government guarantee of access to dental care through the Medicaid program, his mother was unable to find a dentist who would accept their Medicaid coverage. And it wasn't just his mother who was trying to find a dentist who would see her two, uh, two of her boys. Uh, they had a nonprofit that made dozens of calls to dentists, trying to find a dentist that would take Diamante and his brother. Only one in six dentists in Maryland accepts Medicaid coverage. Medi uh, Diamante needed to see a dentist because he had a toothache. It turned out it was an abscess. It became infected, and that infection spread to Diamante's brain. By the time he was admitted to an emergency room and received $250,000 worth of surgeries, it was too late. He had succumbed to that infection. 